I mean, if you're part of the Chiefs kingdom, this isn't your first time um, having your heart ripped out and stomped on. Uh, it builds character, right? I mean, this this is a fan base with a lot of character, and and you got you got a little more character uh, on, on Thursday night. It's kind of like you know, every time I have a car, um, you know, real quick, uh, growing up in Raytown, I, I bought a new car. I was very excited about my new car, and uh, I drove it to a Dairy Queen. If you've ever been to the Dairy Queen on 350 Highway in Raytown, it's got a really funny turn in the mm-hmm. way you have to get into it. And there was a kid in his mom's minivan. I'd ha- I hadn't even made my first payment on this new car, my first ever uh, new car. And apparently he decided he needed to go to the bathroom. It was, a, it was a, a free concrete day at Dairy Queen, and he backed right into my new car, which I, I tell that story to illustrate two things, um, because I did not uh, file a police report, and I did not take it to insurance. Um, so I, I, I say that for two reasons. One, you can't have nice things in Raytown, um, which we all know. But two, um, I always used to say, well, you know, I mean, the car's got character. It's a little bit like me. So that, that's what it is. You ding that sucker up, and you proudly wear it because, dang it, Chiefs fans, what else are you going to do at this point? I mean, just wear it, right? That, that, is, a, that is a unique analogy there, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do you, you – you, yeah, you know what? Nick's Nick's got a really nice truck that uh, that has no character whatsoever. Uh, he takes much better care of his vehicles than I do, so that's the moral of that story, I guess. But I, I you know, I I watched the whole game in about thirty six minutes uh, because of the timing of everything, so I didn't have a lot of time to process the emotions. Um, you know, but let's hear from uh, Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and, and see what they thought about the loss, because obviously, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but. As as devastating as it was, as much ten dollar beer as was wasted by being thrown on the field, um, I don't. You're assuming it was beer. It just could just be obvious. Well, <laughs> well, I don't want to know what it was. It wasn't beer when it was sliding out of there. <laughs> but but um, you know, as much as it, nothing really changed in the at the end of the day, as far as what the Chiefs have in front of us. But but uh, but let's hear from uh, Reed Mahomes here. Yeah, you, well, as long as we learn from it, that's uh, that's the important thing right now. So uh, you get in and you, you know you don't take anything for granted at home or anything else. You you got to bear down, and and that's a good football team. So we we've got to you know, the best thing we can do is learn from it and make ourselves a better football team. I mean, they have a good defense, and uh, when you don't execute and you get penalties and stuff like that, that stalls out drives. And so uh, we. We got some. We got some scores, but whenever we needed to move the ball at the end, we we didn't execute, and so uh, it's um, it sucks now. But we're gonna kind of recuperate and uh, come back and try to win these next two games. Well, and I, I will point out, I I we both did wear black. I didn't wear it on purpose. I picked this outfit out the night before and set it on my couch since I had such early morning, um, and so maybe it's my fault. But I noticed uh, you wore black today too. So it, are you going to a funeral? Is that what this is? I, every time they lose, man, I wear black the next day so people know that I'm not in a good mood. Or, or that people assume you're a Raiders fan? That's never <laughs> happened to me. Ever. <laughs> All right. I wish. I hope you guys could see the video <laughs> of the, the daggers Nick was throwing from his eyes. In all fairness, I throw that to you all the time. That, that's true, but these were particularly uh, uh, harsh and silver um, and black. Silver and black. Get it? See what I did there? Yeah, no, no. I brought it right back to the Raiders. I heard you. I'm saying you're a Raiders fan. <laughs> move on with the podcast. <laughs> well, okay, but uh, we hinted at it before we went to to Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes there. But, I mean, really, in effect, nothing. Ch- the Chiefs are still, if the playoffs started today, the Chiefs are still the number one seed. Um, and so if the, if the Chiefs went out, nothing changes. I mean, everything the Chiefs have, have, have been playing for up to this point is still out there. They just obviously they have no margin for error. And it would have been nice if they'd had a couple weeks to rest guys and, and to do whatever they wanted to, to play vanilla, to work on some things, to refine some things and not have to worry because they already had to buy assured. But, um, you know, from the standpoint of they're still in the number one position, they still control their own destiny as far as home field. Are, do you still feel okay despite the loss, uh, you know, coming out of that? Or are you, like, really worried now that, oh, oh man, this game at Seattle, their, their goose is cooked, they're going to be the five seed in the wild card? Um, right now, I, I think Seattle's going to be extremely tough for them. Before the, uh, before the Kareem Hunt video came out, I was pretty confident that the Chiefs, they, they were going to have their way with the with the Ravens and Seahawks and and that aspect of it. And I, I thought in the Raiders as well, and I thought they'd win all those games handedly. But once he once that incident occurred, and then 
Watkins not being out there on the field, those combined, it just really took a lot of wind out of their sail, and they still haven't honestly recovered from it. They're still they're still struggling with all of it. Yeah, not the same team it was a month ago, but I still think are they it, to the to the degree that you ever thought they were the favorite in the AFC? Are are they still that in your mind? I, I no, they're, they're not the favorite to me in the AFC because. Uh, the defense has got so many problems. They haven't fixed the penalty issues that they have. Um, the defense is based on its pass rush, so if they get tired, there's not really a rotation to effectively help them. And offensively, they're they're still trying to find their way. So all, all it's going to take is a team that can uh, do what the Ravens and Chargers did, which hold them to eight possessions. Yeah, control the uh, clock. Yeah, and then, um, and then play good defense and – uh, uh, you, I, I, in some ways, I felt like you saw a precursor to what potentially could happen to him in the playoffs. And let's let's break down real quick that final play too, because obviously the Chargers went for two. Uh, Do we have to? Well, but I, I want to know. Okay, so they they go in the bunch formation, yeah. um, and you've got Skandrick on the outside, Kendall Fuller, um, you know, lined up um, to his right. Um, who who are you putting that on? You know, because obviously they run a little pick play. Uh, the guy that Fuller was covering up initially comes outside. Skandrick crashes down inside with his man. But should Skandrick have, have been a little more savvy and, and, and gone with the man outside? Or do you think Fuller blew the coverage? Uh, in all honesty, I mean, uh, it, it just comes down to when they were communicating who takes who. No matter what, who do you have? And they they didn't seem to understand that concept between the two of them. Yeah, it looked like it looked like Fuller expected Skandrick to go with him, and yeah. obviously Skandrick Skandrick did not hesitate at all in, in crashing with his man, right? As if he was trying to trail through um, and, and not get caught up in the traffic and not get caught up on the pick. So I agree. I think it looked like two guys who didn't know what defense that they were running. Hey, oh, what 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 frustrates me the most about that play, and it's a microcosm of that defense in general, is you got two veterans that have been in the league long enough to know what a team should or shouldn't be trying to manipulate right there. So that's one. Now two, but they, there are also two guys who have 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 been with the team less than a year though, so new fairly new to the system. Although we are in what week fourteen. Yeah. So now, second part of that, how between the two of you. In 16 weeks, because I'm including training camp when they when he joined Skandrick. How how do the two of you not know how to communicate what you're doing yeah. in, in that aspect? Because they literally communicated and they still didn't get it right. If they didn't communicate, I totally get that, but they did. They looked at each other and and Fuller looked furious afterwards after the play was over. So he was he was not happy. Yeah, and and then that was embarrassing and. That part of that's coaching, part of that's on the players, and, and I'm not surprised that it happened. So yeah. if I'm another team, I mark it down, and I make sure that I have Skinner and Fuller, and I'm going to pick it again, and I'm going to do it again. Okay. I'm gonna see. You think Seattle's going to run a few bunch formations? I would if I'm Seattle. <laughs> come play out time. See if they figured it out. Yeah. So. Well, on the positive side, and we're going to try to we're going to try to have a little positive news going into the break. A little positive news coming out. Okay. Positive side, Eric Berry only played what about 30 snaps. Um, he made some plays also looked like he got, he, you know, he had a, a couple missteps all in all about what I expected. He played about half the game. Um, and he was, was sometimes he looked like Eric Berry, the great. Sometimes he looked like a guy who hadn't played in almost two years. Yeah. Eric, uh, yeah. I mean, Eric, Eric, he, he had better closing speed than I, than I thought he would coming into the coming game. forward. Yeah. Coming yeah. downhill against the run or again. Yeah. Yes. I agree. He, he yeah. Had better closing speed. Now, obviously that one where he throttled down cause he thought, I, I don't know what he was thinking, but he throttled down on that one play where they caught the big 20, 20 some yard strike over the there. top. Yep. That one I was kind of curious about, but um, yeah, I mean, in terms of run support, he was there. He was able to help him out. And then I know the videos circulated around on Twitter where he was fiercely trying to get players in position inside the red zone there, which, again, that's a pattern. It's the second time we're bringing that up in a football game where they don't seem to be able to grasp who's covering what or what alignment they're supposed which, to which be. Just, it shouldn't be happening in week 14. No, it shouldn't. But that's it. Uh, for, well, let's hear from Barry and what he thought about finally getting back out there first, and then and then we'll address some other things. I felt pretty good, you know. Uh, 
got a few different looks that I couldn't get at practice, and you know I felt like we handled them well as a defense. So uh, short week, but you know I think we did pretty well. What was the reason for you not being in near the end of the game? Um, we came in with a plan, and we just stuck with it. You know we didn't want to push it past that, so we just stayed true to that. Did was you play a snap any? count, or was it like a half, like maybe first half, and then um, out or just? I mean, we just, that's just between me and coach. You know, we just talked about it and felt like I was good where I was at. Did you feel any setback during the game, or did you feel about the same? Um, about the same. You know, it wasn't any setbacks. You know, just wanted to be smart about the whole situation. That was Eric Berry talking about his performance, and, and we've talked about it before. The injury he's got is just one where it's about. Uh, what he's comfortable being able to do. Cause it's not, it's not going to get better. It's not going to go away. It's about how much tolerance and not necessarily pain tolerance, but just how much he can handle um, dealing with um, this nagging, you know, nagging injury. Um, and, you know, so I, look it, all in all encouraging to see him out there. I think that the more he's out there, the more reps he'll get, um, the, the, that means less reps for some of the other guys in, in the defense, which can't be a bad thing. Um, and I think the more he will, uh, you know, get guys together, get guys on the same page, because he is one of the guys that has a lot of experience in this system. Right. Um, so I think the more he gets out there, the more it helps. Um, I still don't know how much it helps. But, but uh, you know, I mean, at this point, when we talk about the lack of communication, stuff like that, um, it's a coaching issue, right? I mean, you, you got to think it's a coaching issue. And can having a guy like Barry, who's a bit like a coach on the field, help? It, it will definitely help. And if he was out there, I don't think they have the – I hope they don't have the same struggle in the bunch formation. But that's part of also kind of the concern is how come he's the one who has to be out there for that. Yeah, why has no that, one else stepped for up? For that to work. Why, yeah, yeah, you've had 14 weeks to get this figured out. How come nobody else has been able to – carry that mantle while he's been gone so to me that's kind of inexcusable given how many veterans you have and I mean here's a reality of defensively I tweeted out is um you have you have three corners three slot corners trying to play on the team right now Fuller's a slot corner Scanner's a slot corner Nelson's a slot corner but you got two of them trying to play outside so I mean it, it I, I just I think they're mismatched from from jump street and uh Chargers took full advantage of it last night, and some other teams are going to here in the future. By the way, without Melvin Gordon, without Austin Eckler, and without Keenan Allen for half. So yeah. it's not like this was a monster Chargers attack that was coming into Arrowhead. Right, right. Yeah. It, uh, yes, that, um, that that is the sad part, and that's what kind of infuriated me the most about their performance there towards the end is three of their better players weren't out there. Williams was the guy they were feeding the ball to when it mattered, and he, he couldn't stop that. All right, guys. Uh, so I, I guess I, I oversold the positive note we were going to go into the break on, but uh, we'll be right back after this on fourth and one. Welcome back to fourth and one. And, and I, look, I'm not going to oversell. We are going to talk positive things here, Nick. I mean, because obviously it, it's really easy to linger on the negative uh, in a game like this. But there were some positives, most notably uh, the play of the running backs. Yeah, yeah. Da- Damien Williams and Daryl Williams. I was happy with what I saw from both of them. Damian ran with some ferocity, man. That 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 uh that one time when he ro- it, when he rose up into Derwin James there, when he ran him over, yeah. there was a penalty on the play, of course, because we can't have nice plays. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, it's like it's like the, I mean, they're, they're kind of like the Raytown of offenses. Um, you know, I mean, it, a lot of Cadillacs like me you know, live there or on that offense, but we still can't have nice things. We have a lot of penalties. We do a lot of dumb things. Did you just compare yourself to a Cadillac? Yeah, I mean, that's... that's. I see you more as like a Pinto. Ooh, ouch. You know, my mom, uh, my grandma used to have one. Uh, they're, they're better cars than you think. Yeah, well, there you go. Light blue hatchback. It was sweet. Yeah, but, but from a running back perspective, since we're getting back to the real world... Um, Would you call Damian Williams... I mean, if... If... if uh, if Kareem Hunt was a Cadillac Escalade, what is Damian? What, what was Damian Williams last night? He is a very reliable Dodge Intrepid. All right, got a few miles on him, but still, still purring. So I mean, he was still fast. I, he, like he had some bursts that yeah, I did well, more bursts than I thought. He, uh, we knew that he could catch the ball out of the backfield, but he was more effective in that role than I thought he would be. Yeah, I, for me personally, that's the guy I'd like to start with and kind of be your, kind of be your, uh, <clears throat> like, like I've tweeted before, your speed back, and then. Daryl Williams came in, brought a little authority Hammer. to him. Hammer, and, man. And between those two, honestly, those are the two that I that I personally wanted him to go with for a while, and I'm glad that they did. Where just doesn't have the burst. It's not there. 
And, and it's not a knock on him. I mean, he's no. come back from an injury. So so it's just not there. But if you can use him as a power back, I mean, you rotate him in. But uh, uh, Damien Williams and Daryl Williams, that's, that's what's going to keep your offense up to as much of a par as it was before. Yeah, and I, I think if you're looking for something to take from a positive standpoint of that game, besides Eric Berry's return, I think the fact that – if they're smart enough to keep utilizing those two guys in, in the way that they did, um, you know, I mean, I think that that solves a problem that, that's been an issue for the last right. couple of weeks. Cause we also Damien, uh, you know, we, we talked last week about how red zone rushing uh, was an issue, but Damien powered in twice. Um, mm-hmm. and, and look, Jeff Allen, I think uh, had, had something, mm-hmm. had, had a hand in that too, but let's hear from Damien Williams about how he felt like he, uh, he played as the feature back. Uh, and just to, you know, the offense energy, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'm looking, looking at them outside, you know, from the sideline, seeing, you know, how they operate and, and being able to get behind that line, you know, my first start as, you know, Kansas City Chief, you know, it was a great feeling, you know, the entire offense, offensive energy, and, and I was able to feed off of that. All right, that was Damian Williams talking about, um, you know, trying to bring energy to the offense, and I think he did that. There were also, though... I thought there were a few surprise negatives. Um, you know, we, we talked about, um, I thought Kendall Fuller, um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about his injury and the impact that'll have, but, but I thought, you know, outside of, especially that, that last uh, drive when he just got owned by uh, uh, Travis Benjamin a couple of times, um, and then obviously was part of the mix up on the, on the two point play. I, I thought he had a pretty poor drive, but the one that was uh, even more disappointing to me was, um, Mitchell Schwartz had a couple key, key mistakes, I thought. He's been so reliable, um, and so maybe it's unfair to pick on him a little bit, but he had a holding penalty uh, when they were deep, when the Chiefs were deep in their own end zone on a long completion to Kelsey that kind of short-circuited drive. And then after the Chargers had tied it, or had gotten within a touchdown at 28-21 late in the game, uh, he missed a block on that uh, on the Chiefs' last possession um, that, and Mahomes gets sacked there, and it really put him behind. They end up having to go three and out, and that kind of set the stage for everything that happened. And uh, anything, any picking up off that, or anything you noticed that kind of surprised you that you felt like contributed to this loss? Um, uh, for me, it, not necessarily surprising, but the, the Chiefs' pass rush, it was gone by halftime. They were so worn out, that there wasn't much left for them to do, and and they really don't have much of a rotation to bring in to effectively maintain that. And how and much then, of that is on Brett Veach though? Because I mean, you know, they brought in Breland speaks and that, that has not worked. I mean, he has not been able um, to help, but they've also, there's guys that have been in the system that kind of predate Veach a little bit, at least in terms of he wasn't the GM when they were picked like Tano Passanio who haven't developed either. Um, you know, so, I mean, is that, again, is that, is that coaching and development or, or does Veach have a little culpability for the fact that they can't seem to, you know, they don't have enough bodies there. One that some Veach is going to have to improve upon regardless next year. Um, <clears throat> what kind of irritated me was when I saw Tano Passanio inactive yesterday while Frank Zombo's active. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm well, sorry. Special teams value. Well, but that, that, that's kind of we have all these guys on the roster that hey they're they're reliable special teams wise. Okay, well I still need a pass rush, and Frank Zombo is not giving me that. Yeah, Frank Zombo is a special teamer. I need yeah. a pass rush. I don't have a rotation. I need Tano passing you. Well, and you didn't. And you you got rid of Hamilton earlier in the week. Uh, you know to no, make room uh, for Jenkins. Oh, Jenkins. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You got rid of Jordan Jenkins earlier in the week. Uh, you know, so thin that out a little bit. Um, you know, and 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 then you kept a rush linebacker over Tano passing you. And, 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 active other, ones. and, and, and I, I know this isn't the case, but you got five or six safeties and they're all active because you're using them on special teams, but there's no reason Jordan Lucas should be standing on the sidelines. Utilize and a, and him, a as a, cat. Utilize yeah. him as a blitzer. If you need to, I, I know, I know that the coaching staff loves Daniel Sorensen and they love Ron Parker, but those two don't have the range to do half the calls that you have. I, I think I, we've said it before. It's a, it's a wasted opportunity not to get Jordan Lucas reps right now. It just is. He, it's not like, I mean, how much, how much worse could the defense be with Jordan Lucas in there than it has been? I'm, or, uh, or on the alternative, would it not be better at this point by having him in there? Perhaps I personally think it would be better. I think you, they could at least benefit from it, but if they want to keep having Eric Murray drop uh, interceptions whenever he's got opportunities, then I, that's kind of their call at the end of the day. And Skandrick's I mean, good at the dropping of the interceptions too. Yeah, he does about every week now on top of holding five different times in a game. 
that occasionally do or don't get called. And then he gets frustrated whenever the receiver pushes off for the touchdown. Well, the ref watched you hold half the game, so they're not giving you that one. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Although I, I do think the NFL needs to decide what offensive pass interference is, though, because um, I, I thought um, w- what Williams did was was far more blatant than what uh, Dallas Goddard did, uh, the Eagles tight end, um, when he ran up, you know, closed the space, and they did a swim move past, um, you know, the slot corner in the Cowboys game. And they call that offensive pass interference and call back a long touchdown play. But then, you know, uh, the, a guy extends his, his arms in a situation where it's clearly designed to create a, an advantage. Yeah. And it worked. It created the clear advantage. Um, they don't call that. Um, but I think that that's a larger issue that the NFL has to deal right. with about about how they officiate their games. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it's inconsistent. I understand why, why people might be frustrated by that. But, you know, I mean, it... it at the end of the day, I don't think that that's why the Chiefs lost. No, and and part of it is they had a couple. <clears throat> For me, the Chiefs game came down to this. They had a three and out where Harris didn't get aggressive and catch the ball. He didn't box out the defender. He just let the ball try to come to him. That stopped one of their drives. That stopped their momentum because they were probably going to go in and score that drive because they'd had a good return, if I remember correctly, on that on that one. So they had great field position to be able to make a play and to keep that drive going. That was one of their eight possessions. So because of all these possessions that they had that were reduced, it magnified each mistake that they had, each penalty that they have, each time that something didn't work out their way. And that's what's going to happen in the playoffs is things are going to get magnified and you're going to have to be perfect on as many possessions as possible. Otherwise, you're going to lose and you're going to go home and your season's going to be over. So I, I, that's why I think last night was a great indicator of where this team is or isn't at for the next couple of weeks and what they still need to fix if they want to get to where they want to go. And defensively, I mean, look – Pass rush disappeared in the final two drives. They didn't bring any blitzes. They ran the same up-the-field rushes that they always do. So the tackles and the offensive line were used to their sets and how to drive them out. And that that fourth down play, that's the one that infuriates me because they went man across the board with two deep. So when you see that two deep, you know the middle of the field's open on both sides. They went and went Benjamin against uh, Fuller, but Sorensen was on the other side. And when I watched the high 50, both were open. So Rivers could have thrown either one and gotten the first down. Instead of that, on that fourth and eight, I personally would have had a zone. So Rivers at least has to hold on to the ball so that the rush. G- give ha- give it a, a chance. chance. Yeah, give it has a chance. a chance. Because if you're playing man across the board, Rivers is just picking his best matchup, especially with that two deep. He knows middle is open, so then that's what he's going to do. And he knows Bob's not going to be creative and bring down a robber or do this or do that in a crucial situation. And the Rams did the same thing. Well, maybe, Rams, maybe saving it for the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, the Rams did the same thing. It's the yeah. Chiefs with Everett to where Sorensen was isolated man. Safety wasn't going to get over in that single high look. And – that's just kind of what Bob does whenever they get in pressure cooker situations because he goes back to his man coverage and what he knows and loves, and the good quarterbacks pick him apart, yeah. and that is going to happen again in the well, playoffs. Yeah, Even the slightly above average quarterbacks like Jared Goff. But uh, uh, <laughs> real quick. Um, Shade thrown. Uh, did anybody want, go back and watch the Bears game if you don't believe me. Um, Kendall Fuller, though, um, you know, Ian Rappaport is reporting that uh, he – uh, he's going to have surgery on a broken wrist. Um, he was playing with a cast on. If only I knew about that type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what, how big of an impact is that? And, and, and uh, you know, I mean, what, what, what light can you shed on the situation? Well, I, I, I saw his cast. Thanks to uh, Arrowhead pride putting up the photos yesterday. Apparently, yeah, I don't know when he made the interception, I gassed on his right hand and, well, where his cast is at, it actually looked like it was more of the wrist. They were trying to support the wrist and the thumb area there. So I'm wondering. Do, do you think he fell in his garage, Nick? Do you have any? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he had what I had happen to me, no. Um, I well, mean, no, I mean, but you've just come off a, a, a broken wrist, so. Yeah, yeah but, but for me, mine, mine uh, I can tell that mine was probably – Worse than what his is based on the photos is because I had a cast from my elbow all the way up to all the way up to my thumb, yeah. and he didn't he didn't have that in last night's game. So um, I, I'm hoping it's going to be easier for him and that he'll be able to play through it. I just know when the doctors talked to me about mine, um, 
they 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 wanted to cast on it for six weeks so that it wouldn't move whenever they whenever they did surgery and made sure that it healed correctly and they said that it would take six weeks for the bone that I had to break to to fully correctly heal. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know what bone. Obviously, we don't know what bone no, he broke. Don't or, don't know what bone. Don't. I mean, honestly, at this point, don't even know if he's guaranteed to miss any time because depending right. on what it is. Um, if if it's something they can cast and it's not a big cast and he can still play with it, it has some range of motion, it's possible he could still play. We'll have to wait till next week probably to find out those answers. But if he's not available, how big a blow is that to the defense? I know I know this sounds bad to say, but I don't I don't think it. I don't well, think but but I mean, who who, uh, who steps in? I mean, it, you know, if they had somebody who was any good, you'd think that they'd be playing, right? You know, uh, <laughs> with with that coaching staff. There's guy. There's some better players on the sidelines that they keep on the sidelines whenever, uh, well, when, whenever they uh, get the trusted guys back with their scheme. So it may force them to actually play somebody that deserves some playing time. They may have some struggles, but I mean, uh, here's the thing: Nelson and Skander can both be slot corners if they need to. Yeah, they're both capable of doing that. So you can bump one down. You just gotta put either Smith or Ward as your outside corner. And they may have some growing pains. They may have some problems. Or maybe let Eric Murray play corner. <laughs> Could do that too. Uh um, have options. Yeah, they they definitely have options. So it's just a matter of what they want to do. But I mean, I, I I'm not saying that there wouldn't be any issues, but I but I mean I, I don't think the drop off is as insane as they're are they're already bad. It's yeah. not like they're gonna be Horribly, epically bad because they're already kind of there. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's hard to hard to go down from from the bottom. You know? Yeah. So, all right, hey, we're gonna take another quick break, and when we come back, uh, we're gonna wrap it up and uh, you get you get you in the holiday spirit, all right? Welcome back to the Fourth and One podcast. I am Todd Palmer, joined by Nick Jacobs, um, and, and we talked about this earlier. Nothing really changed as far as seating. Um, you know, the Chiefs are still. Uh, you know, number one, even though they're tied in, with the same record as the Chargers, they've got a better division record. Um, and, uh, you know, and they, they own the tiebreakers against the Chargers. They've still got a one game lead. Um, or, well, I, I guess one and a half, depending on, you know, when, when you're listening to this over, um, you know, the Texans and, and, uh, you know, there, there's no danger. They're going to fall out of being the top seed or at least, um, you know, atop the AFC standings, um, because of this loss this week. Uh, but they've got games left, um, at Seattle and against Oakland. First of all, Nick, do you think they can win both those? Or, or, yeah, they're definitely capable of winning them. Will they win both those? Man, I don't know about Seattle. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah, Seattle, I think, I think they've made Seattle tougher on themselves than you would have hoped it would have been a couple of weeks ago. Would have been nice to go into that game already having the AFC West wrapped mm. up and and knowing that a loss doesn't hurt you. But if there's some good news, look, the Chargers and, and obviously both teams get a couple extra days rest. Um, the coaching staffs get a couple extra days preparation for the matchups next week. And although the Chargers play on Saturday against the Ravens, now it is in Los Angeles, but we just saw what that Ravens team can do um, on the road. Um, so. Chargers, they have the Ravens and they play at the Broncos. What what chance do you give the Chargers to run the table and really put the pressure on the Chiefs to be perfect down the stretch? I honestly think the Chargers is tumble in one of those two games. I think the Ravens is more likely, but I mean the Ravens playoff. Well, they've already lost the Broncos once. Yeah, uh, the 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 Chargers have correct, but the Ravens playoff futures on the line, so they really got to win out to guarantee themselves a spot, and then. The Broncos, Vance Joseph is trying to keep his job. Yeah. So I mean, it, the, the Chargers won't have it easy with either either one of those games. And I'll tell you what, I, I I came out of this game the same feeling the same way that I did after the Chiefs lost to the Patriots, and the same way that I did after the Chiefs lost to the Rams. I think most days, um, and certainly if the Chiefs play their best, they're the better team. I mean, I, and I feel the same way about the Chargers. I think the Chiefs are still a better team than the Chargers. Last night they were. They just uh, the Chiefs, the Chiefs didn't do what they had to do to get that W. All right, and then you look at um, besides the Chargers, um, I think the Texans are actually the biggest threat 
um, to maybe steal uh, to move ahead of the Chiefs because they they're at the Jets, they're at the Eagles, and then they host the Jaguars. That's not exactly a daunting stretch of three games. The Patriots are at the Steelers, and then they finish the season hosting the Bills and the Jets. But that having to go to the Steelers, I think, makes the Patriots road a lot tougher than the, than the Texans road. Uh, but ultimately, feel still feel pretty good as long as they hold off the Chargers that they're going to have. Um, you know, they're going to have home field, certainly at least a buy, a first round buy. I don't know. It all comes down to the Seahawks game. They win that, I'll feel all right. If they lose that one, I think they're five seed. So uh, <clears throat> there are probably a lot of people, um, maybe maybe some beer throwing uh, fans in Kansas City, who felt like uh, the refs were responsible for the loss. And obviously, there was the push off. Uh, <clears throat> that, well, there was the. First of all, what did you think of the pass interference call on Kendall Fuller and then the non-call on the push-off uh, by Mike Williams the next play? Did, did you think that those were officiated correctly? I, I personally I personally didn't. I, I don't think Fuller yanked his arm in a way that interfered with him being able to catch the ball. He, he clearly hit that arm early, but given the way that he was stretching, you can't stretch both hands up to me. I, I agree. I don't, I don't think it impacted the catch. No, it didn't impact the catch. Had it impacted the catch, I totally get that call. Um, and, and I mean, and, and, and the receiver got his hand away to where he had free range to get up there and still make the catch. So that, that to me, was an issue. Ticky tack. Yeah. And then, and then that was a push off on Skandrick. But like I said earlier, Skandrick holds a lot, so they're not exactly going to give him the calls. So, I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the beast with that one. And, and I don't think the receiver had full possession of the football before he stepped out of bounds. I, I thought it was an incomplete pass. But I'll also say this. The Chiefs outplayed San Diego pretty badly in the first half, but were only at 14-7. to seven. They didn't take advantage of a couple opportunities. They had a big kickoff return to midfield and squandered it going three and out. Uh, and they had it. We talked about you know, the Mitchell Schwartz play um, in the third quarter and then again in the fourth that really um, – you know, erase drives. I mean, honestly, the offense had a touchdown lead and, and a chance to, to – you win the game if you can just get one first down, and they couldn't do it. Um, so I, I don't put it on those last couple. And I think anybody who's blaming the refs for the loss is ignoring the fact that the Chiefs had a lot of opportunities to take care of business themselves and not let it come down to a game like that. That's why I always think it's foolish to blame the refs because there's – at some point in the game, the team had a chance to make it, make sure that the refs couldn't take a game away from you if you right. think that's what happened. And the Chiefs didn't make enough plays for that to happen. And, and that's normally the case with any game is that <clears throat> teams have an opportunity to put it away to where you never have to worry about it coming down. You're not at the mercy of, a, of an official. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of the reality of it. I, I don't blame the refs. I don't think that the refs didn't. The reps didn't call man coverage with two deep on fourth and eight. Hey, they and besides, they were better. It's not like it was an all-star crew of officials out there. I mean, come on. Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, look, I, but I think the, the, the point stands. It, if Schwartz doesn't miss a block on the last drive, if Demetrius Harris doesn't commit a false start um, that costs him five yards, it, you know, if the guards don't give up pressure on, on the, the third down play there, um, things turn around. There were opportunities to make plays. So, yeah. but, there's a laundry list of 20 yeah. to 30 things. Well, yeah, that's just the last offensive right. drive right there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but let's hear from some of the defensive guys, Chris Jones, Reggie Ragland, um, and how they felt uh, about the defensive performance and, and what was ultimately uh, responsible for the loss. Um, we didn't make the same uh, plays we made in the first half. Uh, we gave up, some, gave up some big passes. Uh, big plays killed us um, second half. What does it feel like knowing you were that close to a lot of things? <laughs> it's tough. Mentally, um, it was very tough, but um, we got to come back and bounce back. We got a game, um, we got a couple days off, got to prepare for Seattle Seahawks at their place. So, um, you know, understand what you did wrong, watch film, and let's make some corrections and bring it at Seattle. We ain't finished. Continue you leaving in the ref's hands, it's always, always, it's always not going to go your way. So, we, we was in position, a couple calls didn't go our way, so, but we got to finish at the end. That was uh, Chris Jones, who had two and a half sacks, by the way, and Reggie Ragland um, talking about, um, you know, what went wrong against the Chargers. And, uh, you know, again, uh, unfortunate, but um, it is what it is. I mean, you, you got the, the Chiefs certainly can't dwell on it. And they've got a few days off, um, come back Monday, um, reinvigorated, rested, and get ready for that Seattle game, right? Yeah. Seattle going to be here on 41 Action News. Or local. 41 Action News. That's right. You can watch it Sunday night football. Um, I know we'll have a crew out there. We'll have a, a full hour 
pregame. Uh, we'll have a, a, an hour newscast post game um, to, uh, to get you fully covered. So you'll definitely want to tune to 41 action news on Sunday, uh, next Sunday, not this Sunday. Cause obviously they're not going to make him play three days later, but you can, Sun- still, you can still watch the game. Just won't be the chiefs game. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, definitely. You should watch Sunday night football, but don't tune in um, on, on December 16th, expecting to see the chiefs, the, the chiefs uh, play at Seattle on December 23rd. All right, I feel like we're going to confuse people at this point. All right. We just watch the night football every week on 41. There you News. go. There you go. All right, speaking of which though. Okay. And we're getting, you know, uh, it, it's, it's the holiday times, Nick, you know, we're between Christmas and new Year's, So I just wanted to, uh, to see, were you planning on getting me a Christmas present? Um, no, no, no. Okay. I'm not getting you a Dustin Gold Gold t-shirt that you had Santa Claus for. <laughs> now, Megan's supposed to get that for my birthday. I'm still waiting for that. No, I just didn't know if you know you had something picked out for me. Uh, because I found a very nice uh, cardigan with uh, some Werther's original stuff in the pockets that I'm going to wrap up just for you, Mr. Nick Jacobs. So you enjoy that. Merry Christmas, Nick. I'm over, do, you have the, do you have the receipt to be able to return it? Yes, I'll get you a gift receipt. <laughs> Although I don't think you can return the Werther's once I've taken them out of the bag. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Hey, we'll be back to talk a little bit more about Chiefs Seahawks next week. Uh, uh, we hope you had fun listening, even though the topic may have been a little sad for you. Uh, but uh, we'll all get over our Chiefs fan PTSD together here on 4th and 1.